from war-torn Ukraine and Sudan to the Mediterranean, 2023 was another tragic year for thousands of individuals leaving their homes in search of a better life. Journeys fraught with peril, where the most basic of human dignity and safety are traded for hope. In September, almost 10,000 people arrived on the tiny Italian island of Lampedusa, nearly double the number of local residents. Not since the crisis in 2015 has Europe seen images quite like this. The Deputy Prime Minister describes it as an invasion. Sparking a humanitarian crisis and fueling the narrative of far-right parties across Europe who aim to exploit a desperate situation for their own gains. But beyond the headlines, what is the actual reality faced by those making the journey to Europe? Are European efforts to reduce migrations to the continent working and at what moral and financial cost? To discuss this, I am joined by Maria Gabrielsen Jambert, senior researcher at PRIO and an expert on migrations and humanitarian issues. We are also joined by Nema El Bagir, CNN's multi award winning chief international investigative correspondent, who just returned from an assignment in the West Bank and is here in Oslo where she delivered PRIO's annual peace address. I am Arno Siad, and you're listening to PRIO's Peace in a Pod. Maria, I'd like you to set the scene for us. What have been some of the key trends we've seen in migrations in the year that just wrapped? And perhaps explain to our listeners what we mean by migrations. Yes, so thank you. I can perhaps start with the first question. Who is a migrant? This is an umbrella term, uh, as defined by the IOM. It does not have a legal definition in international law. It's rather a, a common lay understanding that this refers to any person who has moved away from his or her usual place of residence, whether this is within a country or across an international border. It is often commonly understood as people who have moved internationally. And according to this definition, the World Development Report 2023 produced by the World Bank, estimates that in 2023 we had 184 million people who were migrants. 184 million. Yep, which amounts to 2.3% uh, of the world's uh, population. And, and uh, this includes, very broadly speaking, those who study abroad, work abroad uh, for shorter or longer times, sometimes for a lifetime. And it also includes uh, refugees, unauthorized migrants, uh, people forcibly displaced by conflicts and other disasters. We estimate that around 20% of these 184 million are refugees, meaning people who, as defined by international law, have uh, fled their countries of origin, uh, fleeing persecution. Um, so according to this well-defined de um, definition of refugees. Yet if we consider migration more broadly as the act of uh, moving to seek better life opportunities, we see that most people move within their own countries. Most migration is uh, internal. Uh, we also see that uh, sometimes we get the impression of in the media that most migration is legal. Even most migration to Europe is legal, meaning people who have their ID papers and an authorization to come to Europe. Uh, so now for some of the key trends in 2023, beyond these elements that I just mentioned, we see that protracted displacement continues, meaning people who are displaced either within their country or to a neighboring country, but with no real durable solution in sight. We see, uh, for a couple of other highlights, among uh, a range of situations, we see that Ukraine is still the fastest growing and largest group of displaced people in Europe since World War II, with an estimated 5.9 million refugees from Ukraine spread across Europe at the end of 2023. We have the situation in Afghanistan that is still very fragile, and with people also forcibly returned from Pakistan to, to Afghanistan. We have the situation in uh, the conflict in Sudan with incredibly large numbers of internally displaced following the war that broke out in April 2023 with an estimated 7.6 million forcibly displaced in just the last couple of months in Sudan. Most are displaced internally in Sudan, but also some to the neighboring countries such as Chad, Central African Republic, Egypt, Ethiopia and South Sudan. We have the dire situation in Gaza with the incredible number of 90% of the population estimated to have been forced to flee their homes. 
And finally, as we may come back to afterwards, we see that migration across the Mediterranean, migrants seeking to reach Europe, seems to have been again on the rise in 2023. Right. Uh, Nema, a lot of your reporting is about documenting and bringing the stories of African migrants trying to make it to Europe and the realities of human trafficking. You even went undercover on one of the busiest migrant routes to Europe to witness firsthand the risk and the realities migrants face. I was wondering if there was any particular story in your reporting that stuck with you and that you'd like to share with our listeners. I think last year... Uh, you know, of course, when we went to Libya and we were able to witness for ourselves the auctioning off as slaves of African migrants, the conditions for which were created by European countries and the deals that they had made with power brokers in Libya, that that felt like a moment where Europe's moral calculus had entirely gone off track. But I think the, over the last year, watching what has been happening in Sudan, which the UN has said, and uh, I hadn't actually realized it, got, it had gone up to 7.6 million until uh, Maria said that, but the UN has said it, it is now the largest displacement crisis in the world. And most of them are internally displaced. And that is because nobody is opening their borders to the Sudanese. So I think those two experiences for me are very much, they, they are illustrative of that, that migrant experience. One is the desperation for a better life and where that leads you and how little the world is willing to allow for people from certain parts of the world to dream of that better life. But also then to see that even in a conflict situation where all of the international laws, all of the moral metrics would deem that borders should be open, that the Sudanese have been trapped inside their own country. My own parents, we, my siblings and I, had to evacuate them from Khartoum. Then we got them to Port Sudan on the Red Sea coast. They stayed there for about three weeks to be able to try and get them to the Egyptian border, which was another 30 odd hours. And then they had to sit in no man's land between Egypt and Sudan for 36 hours. No water, no shelter, no food, no facilities. Uh, the number of, of people that I personally know who have had family members die at that border crossing when under international law, the right to safe haven is enshrined. And I don't think it is possible to explain the depth of the humiliation that people feel when they are forced out of their homes by conflict. This is not a choice people are making and nobody is opening uh, their borders or their homes or their arms to them. I want to pick up on something you just said about the European calculus gone off track. Uh, Maria, the EU spends a lot of money into building a sophisticated surveillance system at its borders and the EU's border and coast guard agency Frontex has seen its funding dramatically increase over the past few years. And yet, according to the latest figures from that same agency, irregular border crossings at the EU's external borders in 2023 reached their highest level since 2016 and a 17% increase from the previous year. And this is happening at the time when there is a growing public concern over migration, bolstering one's fringe parties across Europe. But what does your research tell us about how the EU strategy is working or not working in curbing migration to Europe? And perhaps more importantly, what are the consequences for migrants trying to cross the Mediterranean? Yes, yeah, so what uh, our research shows us is that while resources seems to be limited, or European resources seem to be limited when it comes to building up proper reception infrastructures, whether in Italy or in Greece or elsewhere in Europe, to receive and welcome uh, refugees and other migrants. This seems sometimes to be unlimited when it comes to building up and increasing funding for Frontex and for building up an ever more sophisticated border surveillance system. And what this includes is uh, funding for materials like uh, radars, drones, satellites and actual border patrols, whether on land or in the Mediterranean. But also to build up an ever more sophisticated system to, for European border guards to exchange data and information among them. And this goes along the lines for them to improve their situational picture, their situational awareness along the borders. 
One might ask, as you just did, what this actually serves. Does this actually serve the purpose? The purpose is, of course, also to deter further migration uh, into Europe. And to some accounts, it may do. But it can also be argued that this mainly serves the purpose of showing European public opinions that something concrete is being done. We're doing something concrete at the borders. But where the actual ability to prevent people from entering Europe remains always very limited. People will always still continue to try to reach Europe, no matter how sophisticated surveillance systems we have. And while the land borders can be sealed off in different ways, there can be fences, there can be um, border control controls along the land borders, the sea borders are much more difficult to, 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 to seal or control in the same ways. And our research also shows us that while these more sophisticated border control systems are being built up, this does not uh, prevent people from trying, but it makes people take even riskier routes, take greater risks to actually reach uh, Europe. And as this in turn creates situations which we can call humanitarian emergency situations along the European borders and within and outside of the European borders, as Nima just uh, also referred to. I think there's also a really great point that you made, Maria, that when we talk about migrants, I think that there is very clearly absolutely understandable economic anxiety, whether it's in Europe or the UK or in the US. And migrants are being scapegoated. But what is being lost in the ways that right-wing elements or right-wing parties are exploiting that is that when you, as you said, a migrant can be a student, a businessman, a wealthy entrepreneur who has bought his or her right to reside in Europe. And so there is also this issue where when we talk about migrants, immediately now a caricature has been created in the public consciousness of these parasites that are coming to steal the resources that you deserve from your government. They are lessening your, your piece of social support and social resources. When actually, I mean, in London where I live, most of the migrants contribute huge amounts in terms of tax, in terms of how they help local councils maintain basic services. So there's also this idea that every migrant is coming to take. And that is one that, as you said, by, by, by spending all this money on Frontex and visibly closing off European borders, European leaders aren't just exploiting, they are, they are amplifying. Whereas actually there is a, a large contingent of migrants. I mean, students alone contribute huge amounts to European universities, definitely in Britain they do businessmen, those who are there on work visas, the amount that they pay in tax versus the amount that is then taken out of the system, is it's really incomparable. But if you were to ask the average man on the street, they think that, especially in the UK, they think that there are these amassed hordes waiting on the shores of France to jump into dinghies, to come across to the UK, to steal from the local population, when I think the fundamental reality is that any of us who have traveled to these countries knows nobody leaves home unless they have no other choice, right? Like when you talk about the refugees, you are talking about people who are risking their lives and the lives of their children. The other migrants are there legally, are contributing, and in fact, probably are contributing disproportionately to the native population. And I, I don't know if you're seeing that. I'd be interested to know if you're seeing that in your figures. Yes, absolutely. That's why we, as migration researchers, we want to emphasize that the portion of migrants that receive the, all this media focus and attention and the reasons for these border control and, and systems being built up is a small proportion and small share of the migrants arriving in Europe. Mm -hmm. And the largest share, most migrants arriving in Europe are, are legal uh, migrants. And we also advocate for not, um, the opposition to a legal migrant is not an illegal migrant. Mm -hmm. It's not illegal to migrant to seek better life opportunities, but there can be people who are unauthorized migrants, meaning that they don't yet have their papers mm -hmm. uh, in, in order, for instance. And in fact, the question of what drives 
people to migrate is at the heart of a wider research project called MIGNEX. It involves researchers at nine institutions in Africa, Asia, and in Europe, led by PRIO. Maria, can you talk to us about that project and what do we know so far about why someone takes the decision to leave everything behind and risk their life to reach a different country? Yes, so the MIGNEX project takes as a starting point the, what we call this uh, migration development nexus. And this is uh, based on the very widespread idea in policymaking that development and migration are closely linked. Or more specifically, this idea would support that uh, one other way of preventing migration would be to support development, better economic development in countries of emigration. But what uh, research uh, has already shown us and what uh, is also uh, transpiring through this project is that this connection is not so straightforward. So this project set out to really explore these connections by looking at 26 different local areas across 10 different countries, such as Guinea, Ghana, Somalia, Pakistan, Tunisia, Turkey, and others, and to really understand how local development initiatives affect people's either aspirations to migrate or actual abilities and realization of their migration plans. As such, it seeks to really better connect uh, migration management on the European side and development cooperation. My contribution in this project has been more on the migration uh, management side, so looking at the coherence and incoherence of European migration policies. We have looked at, for instance, how the EU uses compensation and conditionalities in their cooperation with third countries, in their partnerships with the third countries outside the EU. These compensations and um, conditionalities, we can call them the carrots and the sticks, if you want, in their cooperation with third countries. And what we see is that increasingly, several of these third countries, at least those who are considered to be transit countries or relatively uh, larger countries of emigration to Europe, they're also aware of this bargaining power that they have vis-a-vis -vis the EU, meaning they're aware of how important this is for the EU. So they will also use what we call this reverse conditionality, saying that we will only cooperate with you on migration if you facilitate, for instance, visa. But back to the question of what makes people leave. This is still a complex question, and it's ultimately a very individual question. Every individual or family considering different options, weighing different options against each other, sometimes in a much more forced situation of conflict or political oppression. But there's always a weighing of different options against each other between staying put or leaving and between going perhaps here or to another destination. And in migration policies, there's also this idea of identifying the root causes of migration. That's often in lines of wanting to tackle or address the root causes of a migration. But it's not as simple as that. Even if we can point to some root causes, a root cause for some may make some leave, but others not. And it is also important to underscore that it's not always just one life condition at the point of departure that make people migrate. There may be multiple decisions made along the way. We can take the example of a migrant in Libya today. They may have initially left their country for a neighboring country in search of better work opportunities, for instance, maybe ending up in, in Libya. But then finding themselves in the hardships and uh, in Libya where, and with the mistreatment of migrants in Libya, uh, seeing no other way out than to almost flee for their lives and with willing to risk almost everything as a last resort by seeking to cross the Mediterranean, for instance. Right. You said something quite important that this is ultimately quite an individual decision. And Nema, throughout your reporting, you've met and sat with many different people trying to make their way to Europe or elsewhere in search of a better life, or at the very least safety. Mm -hmm. Could you perhaps share with us some of the stories you've heard from people on the ground and the reasoning why they need to leave? Well, my personal experience is that my parents refused to leave initially for the first two weeks, and they were caught absolutely in the crossfire of the warring parties because of where our home is in Khartoum. And and their their experience or their obstinance um, uh, and their infuriation of all four of their children was not unique. Most of the Sudanese that ended up leaving to Egypt or to other countries did not want to leave. And I I 
have been doing this job for far too long. Uh, but I think that there is a stereotype of a young man from a village somewhere in the middle of nowhere in Africa who decides that he's going to risk everything for a better life or a, a young woman who ends up trafficked to somewhere like Rome, um, ends up in, in, in horrible circumstances because they are that desperate for a better life. But I have never come across a case that simplistic. I think Maria is very right that people make incremental choices. They they think that maybe, well, if I go to this neighboring country, things will be a little bit better. And actually, oh, well, they're not. So maybe if I move here and then you meet someone who takes advantage of you and says to you, well, actually, I can get you to Libya. Um, and then from Libya, you know, maybe you can find work locally there, which a lot of people initially used to do before the economic situation in, in Libya got so bad. But then you get to Libya and the situation is so awful in Libya or Tunisia. Uh, and then you have no choice but to take that risk. But it is even in the worst conflicts. One of my best friends is Palestinian and American. Um, uh, her family live in Jericho. And she told me this extraordinary story about um, in 1967, during the war, during the Arab-Israeli war, when so many Palestinians were forced out that her grandmother, her maternal grandmother, had, had gathered up the children, had gotten all the way to the Jordanian border, and they were about to cross over and leave. And she saw all of these tents stretching out into Jordan. And she said to her children, if we leave, I don't think we will ever be able to come back. And she turned around and she took her family back in to Palestine to try and maintain that presence on their own land. And I think those are the experiences that I hear about so often that these choices are n never choices that are made easily. And often people make the most illogical choices because their sense of connection to home, to family, to culture is so strong. And the, the thing that I think that I find very uh, heartbreaking, but also, let's face it, racist, is this idea that people think that Europe, uh, you know, European streets are paved with gold. And so therefore, they are coming here to become the multimillionaires that they think that they're going to be in their heads. So many of these trafficked women, actually, that we spoke to, who had come into Europe and ended up in Rome, a lot of them were fleeing abuse. They were victims of abuse. They were survivors of abuse in their own communities, in their own families. And that is not something that I think is reflected. All that is reflected is this idea that they are coming to take what is Europe's, what is the US's, what is the UK's. When often people will say to me, well, in my country, I was a pharmacist, or I was a teacher, or I was a doctor. Do you think I want to be here cleaning this gas station toilet? And I think... Uh, the, the the fringe, the, uh, although can we call them fringe given how populous they are now, the far right has done such a good job of dehumanizing people that you can't even empathize with the reasons that people would would leave. You can't project onto them what your reason would be for leaving your own home. And you mentioned Libya and Tunisia. And for years we heard about EU plans to set up migrant processing centers in North Africa. I recall French President Emmanuel Macron announcing in 2017 its intention to set up so-called hotspots in Libya, of all places, to process uh, refugee claims. The same country where you uncovered slave auctions taking place, and that was just perhaps a few months after Macron announced that. So the EU currently has a deal with Tunisia, where the country promised to tighten its borders in exchange for aid, And there are numerous reports that Tunisian authorities force these migrants to the Libyan border with no food, no water, and leaving them in a state of extreme vulnerability. So what do your investigations, Nema, tell us about the impact of EU choices regarding migrants? What situation is it creating for migrants on the ground? The, the European Union's choices, policies, whatever you'd like to call them, have created the fertile territory for the exploitation and abuse of migrants. They are extorting 
these African countries using aid, which if we believe in a, in a moral world, if we believe in, you know, the so-called civilization of the West, aid should not come with requirements. And you are going to say that aid is, is built on, on us outsourcing our dirty work to you. So that it's not European officers, it's not Frontex officers who are um, manhandling and mistreating and abusing these migrants. We, Europe is outsourcing the dirtiest of jobs to countries that are desperately in need of this aid. And nobody is questioning whether that is really who who Europeans want to be? Is this really the civilized West that Macron and the French of all countries in Europe are so proud of espousing the role that Europe must play, right, in, in kind of the global community and in geopolitics? And then you turn around and you ask people who are desperate to do the worst of the worst to people who themselves are even more desperate. I am rather struck by the argument being made by far-right parties across Europe that NGOs rescuing people at sea in the Mediterranean end up somehow encouraging more people to come to Europe. Maria, in 2018, you wrote a chapter in a book titled Irregular Migration as a Challenge for Democracy, in which you analyze the argument that providing assistance and relief to migrants creates a so-called pull effect by encouraging more migrants to make those dangerous journeys. Can you dispel that narrative for us? And how do humanitarian organizations navigate those accusations? Yes, so this narrative has become a core issue of European policymaking, I would say, in the Mediterranean in particular, but also more broadly in how uh, Europe receives what we call unauthorized migration. Uh, meaning including also people who are refugees but who are yet to be identified as such. And the, the narrative is perhaps best summed up in the context of the Mediterranean, which you just referred to, where it suggests that the very rescue vessels at sea, whether these are led by states, because postal state has a responsibility to maintain a certain rescue capacity, but whether it is these state-led vessels or the humanitarian NGO-led vessels, they suggest that by the act of rescuing migrants in distress situation and bringing them back to a safe harbor in Europe, uh, the argument goes that this makes this into a feasible route to Europe and thereby encouraging more people to make this perilous journey. But not only this, but this rhetoric also suggests that the humanitarian NGOs rescuing people at sea would sort of run the errand of the migrant smugglers. So they are what we call criminalized for their acts of saving lives at sea. And this is not a new, it's not an entirely new rhetoric. The idea that giving assistance to migrants would encourage more people to come a little bit, as you described, Nima, that there are supposedly hordes of people waiting just to get their chance to come in. So this is not an entirely new idea. But in the current context, I would trace it back to 2013, 2014, following a large shipwreck just outside the Italian island of Lampedusa. Mm -hmm that led to 366 lives lost at sea. Search teams in Lampedusa pulled 38 more bodies from the wreck of the sunken migrant boat on Monday, bringing the death toll to 232. Divers can only at that time, that was a sort of a moral shock to Europe. It led to sort of a moral outcry by European leaders at the time which is important to remind ourselves of because it stands in contrast with the way that more regular shipwrecks today much more rarely make the news and the headlines. But at the time, this was a shock and it led to the establishment of this Italian operation, Mare Nostrum, that conducted active search and rescue at sea between October 2013 and October 2014 and rescued probably more than 150 lives uh, during that period. But this coincided also with a time where more people were seeking uh, safety and protection in Europe for a range of different reasons, again. But the connection was then made initially by more politicians on the fringes, as you said, accusing this operation of having blood on their hands for encouraging more people to make the journey. So this operation in itself was accused of being uh, a reason for more people seeking to reach uh, Europe. 
But what I would say was at the time a more marginal and seen as a, as a speculative connection being made. This has become much more mainstream today. Uh, it is perhaps still the more populist parties making this argumentation more more explicitly, but it's become really the most sort of core idea, I would say, going through all of EU policymaking, leading EU migration policymaking into making it more and more difficult for migrants to at all stay in Europe and leading to this sort of race to the bottom of making it the most difficult uh, to, to, to stay. There's this idea that no one wants to be the place where it's potentially a little bit more easy to be than in another country. I just want to mention also that in this um, uh, in the Mediterranean, we see that uh, if we look at periods where there's been more proactive search and rescue at sea, we don't necessarily see a connection that that leads to more people uh, crossing. There's no direct connection there, but we see that more people die at sea in the periods with less rescue capacity. And as we wrap this episode today, we've spoken about people needing to leave their place of origin in search of safety and a better life. But for some, relocation would amount not just to migration or displacement, but complete erasure or stripping of their identity. Nema, you've recently spent weeks in the occupied Palestinian territories in the West Bank. Settler violence has reached unprecedented levels there. The EU, Britain and some 13 other countries released a statement on December 15th describing an environment of, quote, near complete impunity. And according to the UN, 2023 has been the deadliest year on record in almost 20 years for Palestinians in the West Bank. You reported for CNN from Hebron and you got a tiny glimpse of what ordinary Palestinians have to live through and endure every day. Tell us what you saw and experienced in the West Bank. Well, I think you are absolutely right. The Palestinians are uh, you know, an, an almost near perfect example of, of that push and pull of migration. Nobody wants to stay in a situation in which their families are constantly under threat. But at the same time, the idea of, as you rightly put it, the erasure of uh, of allowing themselves to be forcibly, I say allowing, but of course, nobody allows themselves to be forcibly displaced in a situation of violence. But being forcibly displaced, can they ever come home? There is no right to return uh, agreed to by Israel. And so the Palestinians are, are in this pressure cooker. And where we went to in Hebron was an area that actually within the Oslo protocols should have been under Palestinian control. Uh, and yet Israeli settlers had kind of slowly spread into this area, re enforced and supported by not just the, the Israeli soldiers, but the infrastructure of the Israeli state. So to go into this area where you had Palestinians living side by side with settlers, you had to go through a checkpoint, uh, the like of which I have never seen. It was like something out of a post-apocalyptic film. You had these spikes and you go through and they, the, the guards are standing behind this incredibly thick bulletproof glass. It was so thick that actually in the end, because he couldn't hear me or search me properly, he, uh, the guard ended up having to come around the side and look into my bag through the gate, which completely, of course, nullifies having that glass in the first place. And we, we were walking with two Palestinians. One was an older lady who had just done her shopping and, you know, made this extraordinary circuitous journey because every other day a different checkpoint is closed. So you don't know if the checkpoint near your home is going to be open. And she was walking and we could see that all the settlers, the, the Jewish Israeli settlers, were in cars. So that was kind of our first hint that something here was very, very wrong. Palestinians were not allowed to drive. But then once we went into a Palestinian home, the one of the, the lady that we were interviewing, uh, we watched her jump through the back gardens of all these Palestinian houses to climb up over the wall. And she was an old lady. I mean, I saw that report. Yeah, yeah. She, yeah. I mean, to, to, to make it in to her own home. I mean, there were two ladies. It was, it was a very, it was an older lady. And then there was an 80 lady who probably would not appreciate being called an old lady, <laughs> but, but definitely was older. Mm -hmm. And to kind of trudge through the fields in the mud to get into your own home. 
So we're having this conversation with her. We're trying to understand, is this normal? And she said, yes. We Once we have been in our homes, we are not allowed onto the roads because we are deemed a risk to the settlers. And we had walked past the IDF soldiers. They knew who we were. We had security clearance. They were very aware that CNN was visiting. And we came out and they waited. They didn't say anything to us. They waited until we came out of that Palestinian home to say, where are you going? You're not allowed on the road. And I don't know why it was startling, I guess, because uh, we expected that uh, perhaps there would be some logical reason that f- for this bizarre um awfulness. I I can't think of a word other than awfulness that is visited upon the Palestinians on a daily basis. Obviously, the October 7th attack was horrifying and terrifying in Israel. So was there a security purpose? And I said to the soldier, this makes no sense. This is utterly illogical. We have come through your checkpoint. You have searched us. The Palestinians have come through your checkpoint. Everything that comes into this area goes through that checkpoint. The guy at the corner shop told us that he needs permission from the Israeli military commander for the area for every bit of you know stock that is brought in and it is searched. So there is nothing that is in any Palestinian home that you have not searched. So what do you think is going to happen? And he said to me, well, y- you don't know if they gave you something. And I was like, you understand that this is illogical. This is punitive. This makes no sense. And I said, and more importantly, which I think was what made this situation, while, you know, uh, infuriating, what made it also farcical is that the Palestinian uh, family that we were visiting had left and locked their gate. So I said, well, look, I think that this is not an incredibly great idea of yours. And he said, it's protocol. I said, I'm not terribly convinced by a protocol. But more importantly, we have no way to jump over the wall. And it was this really bizarre moment where the soldier went down with his, you know, his rifle cocked as if there was some threat at any moment about to happen to him on comms with the HQ, having to say, no, I have looked in that corner. No, they can't jump over that corner. No, they can't do this. And then he came up to us and finally said to me, okay, we have permission for you to walk on the road. And I, you know, I was trying very hard to be patient through this process, but I couldn't help myself. I said, I said 20 minutes ago, let us walk back up to the checkpoint. We will be searched again and then we can come back down. None of this needed to happen. None of this makes sense. And all he could say to me was this is protocol. And the only The only logical conclusion that you can take away from that is that this is a protocol designed to make Palestinians so uncomfortable in their homes, on their lands, that they choose to leave. But then when they choose to leave, where do they go? And also this idea that I keep here being repeated by European and and American leaders and commentators and unfortunately journalists that, well, other Arab nations should be taking them in as if all Arabs are the same and as if your home in Hebron is the same as whatever facility or refugee camp that you will end up in somewhere in the Arab world. And I think that speaks again to this idea that that the dehumanization of migrants to the extent that they they are not coming from from homes and lives and families and cultures and loved ones that they don't want to leave and so therefore they should either be willing to take what we're willing to organize for them so whether that's detention camps in Tunisia or elsewhere or they should stay in these situations the the older lady who was in the um in our film really, really broke our hearts because she said to us, have you eaten? Um, And we said, yes, and we have to go. Um, But that's very kind of you. And she said, I don't really have anyone to cook for because all of my children have left because it is so difficult 
to go in and out. The the the, the rules, the curfew, the security situation, um, and the confines that the, the Israeli uh, forces place upon the Palestinians are so punitive and are so, uh, you know, they change in every single moment that if you have a job, if you are lucky enough to have a livelihood, you cannot be trapped in these contexts. And so she lived on her own. And, uh, you know, and I still think about that, that on that day, she cooked that dinner and she ate it alone. And she was so desperate for, for, uh, you know, for having, for hearing the sounds of other people around her inside her home, that she invited, you know, random strangers with all of our camera quick kit and our nonsense and, and the potential for ramifications in terms of questions from the Israeli forces as to what she told us and what was said. But that's how desperate she was for human interaction. That was fantastic reporting and I Thank encourage you. our listeners to go and watch that video and that piece uh, you shot in the, the occupied uh, territories. Nema, Maria, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. This episode was produced and hosted by Arno Siad and edited by Brage Pedersen with sounds from the BBC and CNN. Find out more about Prio's events, policy briefs and op-eds on prio.org.